Welcome back to the Music Marketing Podcast. Today we've got two really cool guests on, if you guys want to introduce yourselves. Hello everyone, my name's Mauro, mm-hmm. and I've got Rory. <laughs> I'm Rory. I'm Rory uh, speak. <laughs> yeah, I you couldn't can, for a minute, but I'm back. Um, yeah, uh, Mara and I work at Virgin My Records uh, in the artist content creative team. Mm-hmm. So you're, you're both in that team, yeah? Yeah, yeah, both one and the same. Cool. Just slightly more handsome version. Great. I mean, I think our audience will probably love this because we talk about content and nonstop. We literally force it on them. Um, yep. So it'd be really good to sort of get a bit of understanding on your backgrounds, where you started and kind of how you got your jobs and where you're at now. Okay. Do you want to go first? Because my story kind of leads from mine. Leads yeah, from yeah, yours, yeah. yeah. Sure. Um, I studied music at university, thought I wanted to be a singer. I uh, found out that wasn't very good, so uh, I had to find another means of making money. And basically, just when I was at uni, I there was always like nights which need need posters or friends that needed photo shoots done or my own band or projects that needed logos and artwork. And so throughout that process, just started making things for other people, realizing I could charge people for it. Um, and so left university thinking, not having a job and thinking, this works for a minute, and then applied to every label under the sun for that internship. No one had a look at me. And then I spoke to a friend who was working at Sony Records at the time and he was just like, you're a graphic designer. Why is your CV so boring? Like, why is it just a piece of white paper with text on it? And I was like, that's a good point. (laughs) Um, So I made it bright red, stuck a picture of my face on it and like some nice fonts. So that was it. That was it. It was the face, (laughs) wasn't it? Um, And just, yeah, I just made it really playful. And literally that the day I handed it in, I got a call, um, from Universal HR being like, we think you're perfect for this role. Um, went, flew down to London like the next day. I was in Edinburgh at the time, flew down to London the next day, uh, went for the interview, and then the kind of rest was history. So I did the internship, um, and then six, it was actually a dig- digital internship. So it was like making like advertising banners and social media banners. And it was like, it wasn't really that sexy graphic design stuff that I'd kind of aspire to do. And so I was still doing that on the side. Um, but there was like through that there was opportunities to make things for artists when there was no budgets or whatever uh, and then just grew grew the role and and sort of grew into being sort of creative in the team and then the the buzzword being content and everyone realizing that it's a necessity in artist campaigns we just grew the grew the team out and that's kind of where um Marrow came into it uh, i was able to expand the team and uh, a friend of mine at the label, or a colleague of mine, I should say, um, showed me his Instagram, and and it was some incredible work. And I was like, my boss had always told me hire someone that's better than you. So I was like, mm. I can do that. <laughs> um, so so Maro also at the same time was harassing me on social media, being like, <laughs> I, was, I, I, was, I saw it, in yeah, yeah. And so you know he was getting <clears throat> seeking all sorts of information out of me, and then kind of led to me offering you a job and... yeah it was, it was kind of it was a very kind of like an organic exchange um in a sense that i started in retail um working in retail um but still i did a traditional route i went to uni did graphic design got my degree and it was almost like what do i do with this now um and at the time i kind of just became very complacent with what i had and not really knowing what to do with the skills that i had um so i kind of stayed in retail for a while and my kind of ambition for wanting to be a creative kind of just lay dormant for a long time. Um, and at, while you're st- still in retail and your friends are always telling you, oh, you should go and pursue this, you should do this, like, why are you here kind of thing? But to be completely honest with you, I didn't have the, I didn't have the kind of the energy that I needed at, at the time to possess, to believe in what I could do. Like, I knew what my skills were, but because I hadn't used it for so long, it was like, you might know, you might think that I'm great at doing this, but am I really? Like, who's going to want me at this time? Um, and then eventually it was kind of me just taking the initiative to try and be better mm. and not for anyone else, just be better in general. It was always graphic design for you? It was, it was, gra- it was always graphic design. Never, I never knew I was going to be in music. Like, yeah. it was really weird. Even just being here was really weird. Um, and then eventually I kind of stumbled onto the music because I started animating album artworks, okay. which I had been doing for a long, long time, putting it on Tumblr. It wasn't getting any any notice. It was getting like two or three... Tumblr days. Yeah, so. exactly. Two or three shares here and there. But because I was doing it for me, I wasn't precious about how many people were seeing it. Um, and then I kind of, when Instagram started happening, I started to get the hang of like, this might be something here. So instead of a selfie here and there, <laughs> I then just started putting up work. Um and no one then at the time was still really looking into it. And then eventually I did one for Drake 
Um, not because nice. they commissioned me. I just yeah. wanted to do it. I liked the album. I thought I'm going to go for it. It was for the More Life album at the time. Um, and then the day after, I just saw a notification on my phone. Drake had posted it. And full, wow. from then, it was like... Yeah. Like, the phone was going berserk. Mm. I think my battery would probably be from, like, <laughs> 70 to 30. Um, so, yeah, and that's how loads of other industry folks started to see it from over here, from international, um, international labels. And that's how our colleague at work saw it and passed it on to Rory. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we just we just got to chatting and I saw the opportunity. I was like, this guy's in a label. I'm talking to him now. <laughs> and I'm like, look, I'd love to come and see you. I've got some great ideas. Probably didn't at the time. <laughs> but I'm, I'm taking this. I'm just going to run with it. Um, yeah. And then when it was the time to come and see Rory, I had already loads of work to prove that I was capable of doing mm-hmm. content or being a creative. And, and I think the first time we actually met, you... There was no job there, like on my part. My team wasn't expanding. I'd always ask for more headcount, but but it wasn't um, until probably like three months. And you just kept you just kept in my address book in my, in my emails, and and I knew straight. I knew when something came up that I would go tomorrow. I didn't, yeah. and like my boss goes. Do you want to interview anyone else? I was like, I don't, I don't need to. <laughs> yeah, no, it was a, it was a massive blessing, and like, I'm very grateful for it. Um, but just like. I'd, because of the whole thing, the Drake thing happened, I didn't just get excited by it and then I did nothing. That yeah. was like it was, it was so much fuel in the fire. Yeah. Um, and then I was getting commission from jobs here and there, like real work for real artists, mm-hmm. like big artists across the world. Um, and I think that helped kind of to be confident enough to be like, if I've got a shot at Virgin or elsewhere, I'm just going to take mm-hmm. it. Yeah. And that was a turning point. Yeah, and- I think it's an important one that even artists have where they say, is it worth doing free stuff for exposure? Mm. And it's like, in any career you're in, yeah, because yeah. yeah. it leads to opportunities like this. You have to, obviously have to know your worth to a yeah, point where you should yeah. charge. Um, and if people ask you for free work when you're at a level where you should be charging, yeah, then obviously yeah, that's yeah, a bit yeah, offensive. Definitely. But it shows that if you actually put in the work yeah. and just like... Oh, definitely. And, and, and I, I think the thing with that as well, you know, the amount of times... And, and graphic design is probably one of the most common industries where it's like, yeah, oh, that. do this and it will help your portfolio or photography mm. or anything like that. Um, certainly in creative industries. And it's like, um, I do agree that if you have a passion for the thing, that it, the thing in question, do it for free. Like, it, you know, if they have no money and you're excited by the project, do it. Like, mm. um, it's not, time isn't, You've got some time. I'm sure. I'm sure you can. Like the amount of time or Love Island started. Save that time watching Love Island. You know, <laughs> and and spend an hour a day working on something for free or something that excites you, that's passionate. Um, so yeah, I think you can do things for free, and then and, but then you get to a level, and you shouldn't stop. Like just because you're the best designer in the world or best musician in the world, and someone asks you about something important or something that you could have a valuable input in. Mm. Mm. Do it for free. You make money elsewhere. <laughs> you hear your story just so often in terms of everyone wants a job at a major label and they go through the application process. They don't get invited in. And we speak to a lot of people who work there and they mm. go kind of, it was just coincidence that they happened to know someone, they did something. And I was going to say this question for later, but it's such a, a big question. You have touched on it. Mm. What advice do you have out there for graphic designers and people who want jobs at labels who actually want to get in there and get their foot in the door? I think is have that ambition to want to do that anyway. Mm-hmm. But don't just kind of think that there's only one traditional route for you to go to. Like for Rory, it happened at the time when Instagram probably wasn't popping. So for him to get his foot in the door was to make a creative CV and actually Mm. like hand someone something. Whereas now, when we're looking for freelancers that we want to commission to do either uh, outdoor artworks, animations or TV ads, whatever they may be, we're not just looking for big, massive follow- uh, followers that have like a million followers and you're going to charge us X amount. Like It might be someone who's got 150 followers, but their work is just phenomenal. Yeah. We will find you. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like on this side of the fence, you might, then people watching this might be like, yeah, but you say that, but really, do, we do. Like my Instagram is full of people that have no idea I'm either following them or I've saved their work onto my board mm-hmm. and I'm just waiting for the right project to or get you on board. Or that you even work at a label. I mean, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, There's I don't, plenty I don't of people that don't put shout. it in their, in their bios and stuff because yeah, yeah. you don't want to sometimes because yeah, yeah, then you've got every single artist under the sun DMing you not knowing that you're actually yeah. graphic designers you're not the ones that are going to sign yeah, them yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which is fair because if they don't know that's why a platform like yours is so important because it just gives insight mm. in every direction um, my, my, my advice in terms of like those that you know I, I had a very traditional route of like how I got into the music industry like I, I handed in a CV and a HR 
someone in HR thought it looked good and then passed it through, you know, their ranks. Um, a lot of the jobs in music industries are acquired through knowing, so, like, as you say, it's like knowing someone to, to help get that CV in front of someone above that HR person um, because the HR people receive so many so many CVs. But my thing is it's, it's similar to Marrow's in the sense of most jobs in the music industry you can do without having to work at a record label, as in like... I I could do design covers for you know not being assigned to it or aligned with Virgin Mai. I could I could design record covers for any of my friends or artists that are you know Spotify. Anyone can upload anything to you know you can create artwork similar for marketing that like you can market. And it doesn't have to be friends. It can be that you can go down to see a gig of an unknown artist that's unsigned or whatever and go. Do you have anyone doing your marketing or do you have anyone uh, like promoting you or, or like helping you get gigs or managing you or whatever? All these jobs that are in with the record, music industry like you can do. Sure, when you're at a record label, you get, you get given a roster and you get given jobs. But actually, you can you can do all of it before that and then that will help you get your foot in the door when you when you go for the interview and, you, and, you have this, and they're like, oh, you're doing it already. So you're kind of doing this job. It's what um, you do with it, I guess. Yeah, like, yeah. Drake wasn't a client for you, but it's what you did with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, for is... sure. Exactly. And so I knew that he could do the job prior to it. Like, I didn't have to then interview him and put him through some, like, jump through hoops to, to prove that he could do the job because he was already doing the job. Mm. And then I just needed his skills. And it's, it's a similar thing of, like, there are so many people that want to work in the industry, but there's also... Uh, there, I saw some crazy stat of like there's 500,000 songs uploaded to Spotify every month. Mm. Wow. So there's a lot of people that need artwork, that need yeah. marketing, that need help yeah. with social media, that need like, help with all of that. You know, our our roster is, how many artists are there? There's like 200 maybe? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But they say <laughs> there's 200. That's another, we're one of the biggest yeah. labels in the UK and that's a lot of people. But there is another eight labels in the or there's more than eight but like you know there's the major labels there's the the indie labels and then there's the people just doing it themselves mm. um so i i think i think you can do it you don't have to have a, the sort of email signature saying i work for a major record label to be able mm. to do the stuff in the music industry mm. So what is the everyday job then? What are you doing for these artists? Because um, a lot of people probably think it's artwork and that's you done. What's the everyday job for you guys? I mean, the everyday can be as little as sitting through meetings to think of great ideas and trying to be innovative about how you're going to put these ideas to practice. Or it can be from making outdoor posters to sell the product and to communicate what it is that you want to reach out to people. Mm. Um, it could be as big as thinking what we're going to do overseas to engage more fans. Um, it could be digital activations. But a lot of what we do is very collaborative across all the different departments, whether it be promo, press, or marketing. It's very much how can they get the most out of us to kind of shine light on on that particular artist, on that particular campaign. Um, so yeah, it can be it can be a very amount of things. Yeah, a lot of, that... a lot of people think I'm I just sit there and I just animate stuff. <laughs> Which to me it kind of it hurts. It's like I, I wish, I wish I could be like, Rory, don't bother me today. I'm animating stuff today. Yeah. I animate every once in a while. Now that I'm fortunate enough to kind of know about how the industry works and be more comfortable within the team and the wider team to kind of commission someone else to do it or oversee a project or brief it out really well so someone else can do it and then you just come in and out when you're when you're needed. Yeah. Um so it's a very collaborative effort and I think the, the key there is, is that it varies artist project by artist you know um, what Mara and I will, will, will do is, is help an artist feel more comfortable being creative and, and you know if they don't have a creative arm helping them find what that is and helping them find what that looks like and um, that's a big part of our job is just like helping express creativity in a visual sense you know not a musical sense and um, and so it's like it comes like a lot of the time it boils down to social media because that is the the, the quickest and the most instant thing for people to be creative because you can take a photo and publish it and have 5,000 likes in five minutes or whatever it may be. And so it does start with that with a lot of projects, but then it can be as grand as, you know, designing and, and developing the album artwork for, you know, some of our favorite artists, which is like humbling to, to say like we're working on, you know, some of these huge artists and, and creating... The, like, the first thing that Mara and I ever did physically together was the Laurel Carner album this year, or sorry, last year now. Um, and it was the first time we had our name in print together. And that was like a big deal for us. Like, because, like, you know, we, we collaborate all the time and, and we make digital things and things that no one ever see and all that kind of thing. But for, for the first time, to have like her name written 
uh, artwork by Roger and Maro Borges was was pretty cool. So, yeah. but then but then it can be like I I can work on an artist project and never make anything physical, like never design anything, and it's literally you're just holding their hands and helping them helping them express themselves or finding connecting them with someone else that's a better designer or a creative than us. Yeah. So it's about kind of like you know as Mara says connecting the dots and and, and collaboration and like thinking outside the box a bit of like how can we do this differently or or, or seeing where it's been done better before and, and taking yeah. elements of that. Do you want to take the opportunity as well to name a few artists that you've worked with? Obviously, you sent yeah. us an extensively impressive <laughs> list. Yeah, His list was better than mine. Yeah. <laughs> like, there's too uh, many people so, I literally don't know where to start. Do you want to just have a full license to brag and, <laughs> and tell us all the all the big ones yeah, yeah I mean you've, you've, you've got you've got what's the little one you did last year <laughs> no, so, <laughs> very all humble honestly no. um, so yeah in terms of like uh, designing like album covers um, I was a part in the Luce Capaldi album uh, which was pretty successful last year um, <laughs> I, Mara and I did the Loyal album last year as well I did Loyal's first album too um, alongside sort of uh, some excellent photographers, uh, Alexandra Gavalette, who shot the um, Louis Capaldi one, uh, Loyal's girlfriend shot the last um, his his last album cover, and and so yeah, so that's part of it as well. It's, it's like collaborating with other creatives that are not within Virginia MI, and and you know they're far superior photographers than I am. <laughs> so, um, what else have I worked on uh, whilst at my time at Virgin? I, I so I do like the sort of digital advertising side of things for Florence Machine, Bastille. Um, S.G. Lewis is one that's really close to me. Uh, he really lets me sort of flex my creative muscles and he like entrusts me and Maro now works on it. So we, we work on a lot of things side by side now um, because our skills are so different. Maro, Maro is is got his lane and the stuff that he sees and is inspired by is completely different from mine. So it's always good to like have both both sides of that and then we can meet in the middle somehow so SG's an exciting one yeah. um, that's I mean there's more but I won't <laughs> bore you all I saw the list yeah. <laughs> it's, it's the big list um, I think for me is I get a lot of joy out of working with the developing artists as well um, as much as the, the big ones and also just to touch base on like the stuff that Rory said about SG and the Lowe's and the Lewis Capaldi's like for me to see someone that I work with on a daily basis and I admire and I appreciate what they do. To be able to see him grafting hours and hours and hours and then to see the final products like all the way across the world and seeing it at festivals. I remember we had a moment at <laughs> we had a moment at Glasto where um, we were watching Lewis Capaldi play. Um, well, we started we started off backstage kind of we were supposed to do like this interview piece, so we kind of just got a peep to look out to see how it was like because I had never seen it. I didn't care about Lewis Capaldi. I wanted to see how it looks like from his view, how you're looking out, um, which was insane. And then we went into the crowd to kind of really take in what it is to experience it. And then there was just a, a massive logo of Lewis Capaldi like up on the screen. I was just watching Rory and Rory was kind of just looking up at it. And I don't think I mentioned it, but it was like me watching him seeing what he had created, even it could be, it be just like manipulating some pixels that had like a tiny bit to play in the in the grand scheme of what it is to be Lewis Capaldi. Like, that's amazing. Like for me to see that, I'm like, next time Glasto comes around, I want something to be like, I did that yeah. kind of thing. So seeing someone else just smash it, whether it be Rory, whether it be someone in, in the promo team or in the marketing team, seeing them kind of graft on a day-to-day -day and then seeing it finalized in the real world, that just makes me feel like, I want to do something really cool as well. Mm. Um, but in general, last year, what took up quite a bit of my time was very, very, very rewarding um, was the Krebs and Conan campaign yeah. uh, for Revenge is Sweet. And that was the first time that I'd really kind of grown the confidence and the, the know-how and gained the trust over the two years or so that I've been at Virgin to kind of let people kind of come to me to kind of lead ship in terms of realizing the vision that the boys created for that whole campaign, for that whole album. Um, and so, like Rory said, it was kind of bringing the right people to get the right jobs done, things, things that they could do much better than I could. Um, and in this sense, it was collaborating with a photographer called Phil Maui, who's absolutely incredible, um, based from here in, in the UK. Um, How come he didn't put my name on that album? I thought you were the loyal one. What did you touch? <laughs> 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 I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, so yeah, that was literally from 
making a set build, working with incredible people. It was, it was a lot less of a, a digital-led artwork. It was more like we had to build the set. We had to make the props. We had to work with an incredible graphic designer, Aiden, um, to work on the suite designs. We had to, like, lighting people. It was like mm -hmm. a massive, massive, massive undertaking. Um, and it's kind of seeing it happen and roll out and how fans were reacting to the artwork. Uh, that was the first time I've got, like, right, I'm actually doing what I wanted to do many, many, many years ago. And it's taken this long, but it was all the more rewarding. Mm. That is so cool. And then almost like when they did the show at the, the O2 and seeing the artwork visualized in a real set mm. that cost thousands and thousands of pounds. <laughs> I didn't make the set, but it was little sprinkles of everything that everyone had made. Like and to see it in a room like that, to go to the O2, for me, it was like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> I think that is key though as well. Like, you know, saying you can change one pixel or write one email or have one idea that like we constantly have brainstorms for ideas and there'll be someone that sat in that room that might not work in the project and therefore won't get credit for that idea further down the line but they were the person that birthed that idea and it's like you can influence something and it's like so rewarding knowing that you had that tiniest bit of it like the label there's like probably 90 people there and 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 so there's troops of people all collaborating and coming together to to help one artist project obviously you work on lots of different things but you know an artist project has teams of 10 upwards people that all th all fight in your corner and try to think up how we can make it work for you and it's like um constantly adapting constantly being fluid of being like well that's working so let's keep doing more of that or so how closely with the artists do you work do you sit down with them and have a full meeting where you're talking about like the overall approach to the release is is that yeah. how close you work with them on it i mean it, it depends on the artist because obviously we've got our international roster as well where mm -hmm. we don't get that much face time value even mm -hmm. if they're signed domestically to us so mm -hmm. sometimes it can be more challenging but not impossible mm -hmm. um or it can be like i work with uh harvey he was just in the office just with me right now literally over my shoulder looking at artwork and i'm like ah <laughs> um so it can be as as simple as him coming in, we're, we're sharing ideas and like Rory touched based on earlier, it's kind of building the trust with the artist, the kind of, how am I going to help you literally visualise what you've got tapped into mm -hmm. here? Like musically, I can do nothing for you. I can appreciate your art. <laughs> I can do nothing for you. I'd love to try, but I can't. Um, but visually, I can try my very best um, and we're quite successful at making them realise what it is that they want to put out. So whether it be we go to the studio and sometimes... We're not even making anything. It can just be like what we're having now, a conversation about whatever. You're interested in games? I love games. We talk about games. We talk about films. Mm. But it's the trust that you make along the process that makes that final hurdle of actually making whatever it is you're going for, mm. that makes it a bit easier. I think sharing's key as well to that of like, um, sort of gateway we always want to open with our artists is like, we so show them something cool and, they, and and get their reaction and sometimes they'll go, oh, I'm not sure about that. Or sometimes they'll be amazed by it and I've never seen anything like it before. But then that just opens the gateway for them to share stuff with us. Mm -hmm. And then we then have a better understanding because that's key of like, I, I always say, I'm not the best designer in the world at all. There's there's far superior creatives, and but what I'm good at is kind of understanding people and and like conversating and getting to know what they like and dislike and like putting them in situations that help them, like nurture them to be creative. Um, some people work amazingly in big groups of people, and then like like with the Loyal album, I knew that I just he he wouldn't work well in an office environment. So we just came around my house and we just looked at tons of books like type books, photo books, all that kind of thing. And it was just like, he just picked out things from that. And it was just a really comfort, like comfortable home environment. Um, and you've just got to adapt for, for which artists work. Some artists would love to go to like a gallery and be inspired by other people or whatever it may be. So I think the, the biggest part of our job, whilst it's, whilst we are creators, it's, it's, it's coming up with something, it's making, it's understanding artists and making them feel comfortable. Um, and how, how how much control do they have over it? Because artists are, are people that want to have control over everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're a little bit control freaks, as in like that's their their product being put out to the world. Do they have the control where they say I don't like that, or is it more kind of the labels like no, this will work? No, they have control. <laughs> they know they do, and I think it's wonderful that they do. I think it might have been very different. Um, a few years ago, or or maybe ten years ago, but but now the artist has the power. The artist, you know. And and too right, so they should. Um, we try educate and help and and give advice from our years of expertise and and 
But take it, and that's what that's what Mara's saying. It has to be built with trust. Mm-hmm. We can't just go. This is the right thing to do, and then go. Well, but I think this is the right thing to do. So obviously, I'm going to go with my opinion. I've I, mm-hmm. I've lived with this for. They've been the artist longer than we have. Um, and so the more you spend time with it, they begin to like. I remember the one of my greatest moments with Lewis Capaldi, or it, he doesn't know this, but my my, my personal greatest moment was when. Um, he entrusted me to like to write some copy for him because he knew by that point um, I could I could help you know I knew what he was trying to say so we were like working on like subtitles or something and he was like no I trust you you you, you like like I'll I'll tweak it and adapt it but like that was the first time I was like oh he does actually trust me so, <laughs> it was something so small but it's like you know he was letting me speak on behalf I know he wasn't speaking on behalf of him and he like he he then goes no it needs to be this but even that just that glimmer of trust. To, mm. to go, you understand now what I'm, what who I am, and what I'm trying to say, yeah. um, is a lot, and and it takes artists different different lengths of time to get there. Mm-hmm. I'm so pleased you answered that because in our comment section we get so many artists saying, "Don't sign to a label, you lose all creative control." Yeah, but yeah, you're yeah. kind of proving that that's why you retain. Yeah. That's why I learned at university. I, you know, I went to study music to to be an, a singer. And I had this horrible idea of, of of labels, and like a good friend, like my best friend, uh, is now a musician. And I remember when we were first chatting, he was like, oh, "I don't want to sign to a major record label, like, um, like you you lose all control. They like t- take you for a run." But uh, we want we want you to be the best. Like you're you're the product. You you know yourself best, and we want you to be the best version of yourself. We just want to amplify that, and like. We will will have signed you because you're doing something that we like the look of. We won't have signed you because we're like, they're a blank canvas. We can do anything we want with them. Like yeah. the, it's like it's too difficult to do that now. You know, you can no longer manufacture like pop artists or, or bands or things like that. You know, um, One Direction was probably the the last successful version of that. And and so that doesn't happen anymore. People want real. They want, and so the artist needs to be themselves and we just need to like dial that up and help them express themselves the best they can. Yeah, and I think a lot of the thought behind people thinking that that was the case, even if they do now or before, I think it's worth remembering that the people that work inside those label walls, we're fans. Like we literally are fans too. So for me, being able to work on artists that I listen to on a daily basis or I'll go to your gigs. Like it doesn't matter. I don't I don't listen to you or go to your gigs or buy into who you are because I work at a major label. I'm a fan of music in general. So for me to be able to work on um for example when Darko decided to come on board and work with us on the gangster track, the track was already doing crazy things before we even got near it. Um and the day she came in to to sign with us, I literally I just said to her, I was like, yesterday, I didn't know she was coming in. I said, yesterday I was in the gym just play, uh, playing your music and kind of just vibing out. And now you're here and we get to do amazing stuff together. And she was like, let's go and let's just go and do it. So we're not like these label robots that are trying to mm-hmm. no, it's literally we're blessed to be able to do what we love, listen to the music that we love, and mm-hmm. kind of just do cool stuff on a day yeah, we want basis. to do, yeah that, that's the other funny thing that I always laugh at like that idea because it is it is, it is it is a kind of misconception and it's like we want to make really cool things like I would like to think that you know my legacy is is you look back and you go oh that's that's cool yeah. mm. you know we don't want to just go oh he's a sellout <laughs> <laughs> um, so it is it is a weird thing that that, that misconception exists but I, I understand where it came from it and I think that was sort of the music industry of the past. Yeah. Which um, aspects do you actually work on then? So you do all the design, you do all the artwork, kind of, you've you've mentioned so many different things from yeah. festivals <laughs> to artwork. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, could you just take us through a, a quick list of the things that you actually touch on in an artist's career in the areas? Go for it. <laughs> well, we can split it. well it, 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 it can be any, so it, it can be like lyric videos, yeah. photos for use in like, like literally just for use for social media or photos for artwork or it can be um it can be creating di- like advertising assets so you know the the posters you see in the street or the or the the adverts you get served on Instagram or um it can be the it can be I'm trying to think I mean mm-hmm. the list it, it genuinely is like what what do you need created we're we're kind of the only team in the label that that creates things so like the other the other team the other teams will um sort of strategize and find and find the people to do the job but we'll create we'll create the content so we'll be the ones that make the poster um, work pretty closely with what the marketing team yeah, yeah very I've closely yeah, yeah 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 so they, they you know they, and, and they they will tell us that we need to advertise this thing to this audience and then collaboratively we'll go alright well the best way to do this is 
by making it blue. Mm. Or I don't know. <laughs> so over so, like the past few years, have you had to sort of had a better understanding of social media? Because if you're working on ads, you obviously have to think, okay, I'm creating the visuals for this. How is this going to reach the target audience and then impact them yeah. in a way that yeah, posters say don't? Have you yeah, had yeah. to sort of kind of teach yourselves that in a way? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Kind of, it's, it's, it's a lot of it is... Or, or the early days was trial and error when it became more of like a digital focus first thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but now, because most people are Instagram savvy, so it's yeah. almost like we can't we use Instagram whether it was it would be for music industry or not. Mm-hmm. So you kind of know what works, you know what doesn't, you know what gets engagement, you know what kind of doesn't. Um, so it's like you said, knowing your target audience. So something that might work for Lewis Capaldi on Instagram might not do as well on another platform. So it's when uh, the marketing team need a particular type of asset it's kind of down to us to kind of with them kind of um craft the right asset for the right platform so it's not a case of just churning out stuff putting it out because it might not work for a harvey it might not work for a bastille um so it's kind of like created for purpose for that particular artist Uh, yeah Uh, sorry i can ask her what does work so i know this is a really broad question because art is artist to artist but do you have any tips for emerging artists when they're just like, I don't know how to create a brand. I don't know how to create engagement. Like color palettes, simple things like that. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's like, I think that that really concise aesthetic and sort of brand is falling away a bit because of people's access to, you know, it's just real life now. So I think the important thing is to create yourself and like, aver- you know, cr- give people a version of yourself that is true to you and that is in you know everyone's interesting and it's just finding the things about yourself that are interesting and that's more the brand now it doesn't like i don't see so much it, there's there, there's certain artists where this is not the case and there's certain artists that like are creatively and aesthetically like just genius and that is their brand you know you look at the chemical brothers and like their visuals and their live visuals are just incredible and it's like that you know you go to a gig for the music but also just to see that incredible show and um, whereas I think with so many sort of popular artists at the moment, it's about their personality. It's about who they are as a, as like a musician, but as your friend at the weekend and the part, you know. So I don't think I I wouldn't necessarily give advice on like how to select a color palette. I think I think be brave and do what you want to do, mm-hmm. but but don't like do something because you think it's cool. Do something because it's actually the, be- the the a version of you. And it's like if you always wear black. Always, that's fine. Mm. (laughs) Like, don't feel like, don't force yourself to to be something because you think that that's going to get the most likes or whatever. It's like, and actually, you, and there's so much information available of like, as you said, there is no right, there's no right answer to that because what works for Mauro's Instagram is completely different from mine, which will be different for the biggest artist in the world to like, Lewis Cloud, we were talking about it the other day. He's like, I've got like the anti Instagram. Like, if I post like a nice picture of me, it gets like no likes. But I'll post like a selfie of me up here, mm. and it'll it'll go through the roof. So it's just like these these sort of platforms are so tailored to to your page. Like my Instagram like, is kind of anti as well because I do a lot of like text based like stuff. But like historically on Instagram, text based stuff goes terrible because people think it's like advertising or posters or something like that. But my audience like it. So whenever I post like a picture, I remember I posted a picture of me, and it's just. I'll never post one again. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I, I don't think there is a right answer for of like like how to do it. Like, educate yourself, be inspired by lots of different things. Like, look at Pinterest, go to exhibitions, um, and let other artists. But like, don't just like look at artists in your lane. Like, borrow from other ones because then no one can go, oh, you copied that person because they'll never join the dots. That's, the, that's <laughs> so true, though. Like, because of what Lewis has done, there's this now era of everyone trying to be funny for yeah. one, but also going down this kind of raw route, which isn't sometimes fitting yeah. to their brand. But no, do you think that Instagram is going down that route a little bit of everyone being a bit more honest and raw? Or do you think it's just Lewis? <laughs> I mean, he is a, a gem, as in, as in, he is actually funny. So again, it comes back to that that thing of like, don't be something you're not. Don't try be funny because you think that's what works. If you haven't got the capacity to be funny, because people will see through that and they will choose to watch the funny person over you. Um, whereas if actually, if you can be really motivational, people will watch that because you're because you actually you motivate others. Or so it's finding that thing that is true to you, and it's like with the, the funny thing, it, you'll you'll struggle to dial up something that you don't have like you you struggle to like it'll hit a ceiling and then you're like 
well, this goes nowhere. And the thing with Lewis is that he's just really fluid and adaptive of like, he's funny, but his he knows when his joke gets old and he'll then go into a new joke. So it's yeah. like, mm. that's the thing is changing all the time. A thing that Mara and I used to have to always do, like, you know, swipe ups were like, hey, listen to my new track on Apple Music or, or Spotify or whatever it is. And it used to just be like selfie style. And those used to engage really well because it was like a shock to the system because people were so used to seeing really polished adverts mm. and and they were like, just obviously an advertisement. And then and then people sort of conned on to, actually, it's better if you do something lo-fi and it feels really personal and it's selfie style. But now people are used to that. Mm -hmm. We're having to change again. And we're going to... And so there'll be a process and someone will unlock something new and then the rest of the industry will follow it. Mm -hmm. And that, so it's like, don't be too far behind. That's my only advice of like, either be the person that finds that new thing, which is great. We all want that. Or... or follow quickly like be aware be like super super aware of what other people are doing so that you can see what's working for other people jump onto that in in the absence of finding that new thing are you in the sort of environment where you guys can say i i've got this idea and i and i want to be the person that starts it and you've got the kind of ability and the, the environment you're in they're like yeah give it a go is that how it works because obviously it's a lot of pressure because these people have millions of followers mm. it's not like an indie artist where they're like oh give it a go yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> do, do you guys have the the kind of control to do that yeah definitely it's very like when we we were discussing about the trust thing it's like mm. once the artist feels that you do kind of understand them as a person not yeah. just as a brand and not just as them as a musician mm. they kind of do almost rely on you sometimes to kind of give them that spark of an idea yeah. and we often say sometimes the ideas we have they might not be the greatest one but it might give you the spark yeah, of kind of making the one that you're actually gonna use and sometimes it could be as simple as that but people are like uh, <laughs> Lewis Capaldi that have like kind of cracked the code mm. he hasn't cracked the code because he understands Instagram and the algorithm he knows the algorithm for him mm. Now, I was discussing this with uh, someone the other day, um, just general chit chat about socials and what we should put up and what we shouldn't kind of thing. And it's almost like I think we're too busy trying to chase what's going to work best, what's going to get the most engagement in reach, what's going to get me on the explore page. But really, we're just then trying to play the game of TikTok or wherever you are, whatever platform. But if you understand what your algorithm is, what makes you feel good about what you're sharing with people, I think that's what connects the most. Yeah. It's very hard to trick people now. Yeah. Very, very hard. It's not consistent either. Yeah, yeah. It's not. You're, you end up just trying to get the audience that you don't have rather than tailoring everything to the audience you already have. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just impossible, yeah. isn't it? Exactly. And, it's like, and, and a big thing that, you know, what our job at Label to do is to, like Mara said, is give them like kind of thought starters of like, here's an idea, we know it's not going to be right, but then because they know their brand and they're they're just amplifying that, they then come up with their own idea. But then what we can provide is like when there are trends, you know, it's not the artist artist's job to be on top of every trend and know exactly what hashtag is, you know, when it was like the bottle cap challenge or I'm trying to think of other things. But like, so that then that's our job just to go, hey, there's this thing. Don't just do the standard bottle cap challenge because that'll get lost in the five million other ones. But here's an idea for you to do it so that it's different from the rest and that's kind of like where we come in of like for social media anyway when it's like there are these trends and 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 they come and go in a flash and it's like how can you do it for your fans so that you're being part of the conversation but also do it differently enough so that it's got your spin on it because otherwise you're just another person doing jumping on another trend and does an artist like story come into it so do you do you start with like defining their story and what they're about first and then go into it that way kind of how does the process work when you first sign an artist they don't really have much going on mm -hmm. then you know the music is good how does that kind of process work for you guys starting from the beginning and de kind of defining everything i think for us it, it depends on the level of artist um some artists are willing to kind of just come out and share with you what their story is mm -hmm. um, but some have already done it through their music mm -hmm. so it's almost like how can we tap into what you've probably said already or what you haven't but how do you want to get your story across as a whole um and if it's for example like you said an artist that maybe is with that they're very fresh that they haven't put anything out at all yet people don't know about this story yet so there is no music to kind of get what they're about on a grand scale maybe like if they're more indie the people know about them but to a broader audience how can we get that story across so then it is for us to kind of go in find out more about you your do's and don'ts what you're feeling what you're not um 
and kind of grafting, crafting how they want to tell that story. Mm-hmm. And that might be over a period of two to three years, sometimes longer. It might be a short um, essay piece that they want to write, they want to share with fans. Or it could be a mini documentary based type thing. There's loads of ways that they can get their story out um, without having to do the traditional sit down interview type thing. Because mm-hmm. now it, people are more um, receptive of just holding the camera a bit more candid, a bit more, today I'm going to show you what I like to eat. That's part of my story. Mm. Today I'm going to show you my dog. My dog is a big part of my story. Mm. Um, so dribs and drabs, kind of just keeping that engagement going throughout the, the whole duration of their career. Mm. Do you find on Instagram it's more like feed, keeps it polished, and then story more raw, or can it be both mixed? It depends. I, I like as in, as in if you were giving an overruling sort of judgment, yeah. Mm. But again, it, like... <laughs> my thing with with stories is they're disposable as in they're they're, they're gone within within so that like you when you asked oh do you guys have the power to like put you know to however's artist big following do you have the power to allow them to put something up or, or to influence that and it's like we always just say it'll be gone in 24 hours so if it's or, or if it's or if it's shit delete it like like you, like everyone's got the power to press the delete button and I, I don't know once it's on the internet it's there forever but like <laughs> It's fine. No one will remember it. But that's the other thing of like people's attention are gone like that. So like, w- like one of our biggest jobs that I, I I find we do a lot is like convincing people that it's not like social media and like what you put out there. Be precious over it. But like you can make mistakes. Yeah. Like like you you it, it's good f- to make mistakes because then you learn what's better in, in in the future. So like we make mistakes every day. Like and we're fortunate enough to like if we're making artwork and we're make we can make ten drafts and go which ones you like best and so that's a really fortunate position for us because mm-hmm. people can see the rubbish ones and see the good ones where it's different for like when you're an artist putting something out in the world because you have to put out what you think is the best version, mm-hmm. but it's also okay not to have the best version and then to evolve and and then have a better version next time and that's I, it comes into kind of the storytelling of like. Yeah. Artists should evolve, and they should they shouldn't just come out and be like this perfect thing. That you know, there should be a beginning, a middle, and an end. We always talk about when artists are doing stories as an Instagram stories of like, don't just put up here's me and my dog, here's me in the studio, here's me in my bed. That's not much of a story. Like tell people, oh, I'm going to walk my dog this morning, and then you so you have that intro. Then they're walking the dog. Something might funny or, or not. It doesn't even have to be funny. Something interesting can happen whilst you're walking the walking the dog. That happens, and then you're letting the dog in the house because the dog walk's finished. That's not the most interesting story, but like actually something incredible could happen on that dog walk. Or it's like um, we always use. There's two examples we always use. If S. G. Lewis he was running out of air mouth. I can't remember what they. But basically, you needed to have a to catch a flight to tap over his air miles so that he got a royalty card. I don't, I don't know much about air miles, so I don't know. But essentially, he got on a flight to Glasgow for the day and he just told his audience, that, like his on stories, like, oh, I'm going to jump on a flight to Glasgow today because if I don't, I lose my gold card or whatever it is. And so he did that and he took stories the whole... So people were prepped of like, oh, this is going to happen. This could be quite funny to watch. And then throughout the journey, he, he was doing like votes of like, oh, should I stay in the airport and get drunk or go see the sites? And then so every, each step of the way, it was kind of like Bandersnatchy Netflix style of like people were deciding for him, but it had the beginning then it had the like, whatever was happening in the end and then he flies back and then he had the sort of confirmation email or whatever it was to say that he got his card. And it's like, it had a beginning and the end. It was similarly with like Lewis when his toilet was blocked. He told the world that his toilet was blocked. Then there's like footage of him going to the shop to buy a plunger and then he gets, and it's like is the it most... Planned? No, not at all. Not and, and, and so that, and I that, really that, thought that one was planned. No, no. We, we genuinely thought like planned. storyboarded and everything. Yeah. No, <laughs> not at all. And that's the yeah. thing. And, and like... You, itself, like though, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and people then try to like, like force these things later down the line and we go, the success of that, so how can we help? But actually the best ones come mm. when, when, when it is... And, and then... Again, that's just him knowing himself and knowing his audience. Yeah. He knew that would work. Yeah. Um, so we're putting ourselves out of a job, really. That's what we're here. Um, <laughs> yeah, worked, it was all planned. We storyboarded kind of, it. You've worked in this field for a while. Yeah. Spotify's a massive thing, or streaming platforms are. But did you start creating basically artwork for CDs and like vinyl and all that? How has that changed? Do you feel like it's changed at all? Because now that artwork, it does impact whether someone even gets playlisted or mm. kind of how they... they pop on Spotify do you feel like when you're designing that it actually impacts it it saddens me to say no <laughs> I think it matters less now okay um, which 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 deeply saddens me and like obviously CD sales are going down and your artwork is now becoming like 300 mm. pixels by 300 yeah. pixels 
so I think it matters less, and that's why I'm sat here going, "Don't worry about your color palette, and don't because I yeah. don't. It doesn't matter as much." Do you do the canvases on Spotify? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what's kind of the situation with those at the moment? Because some artists are using them, some aren't. Kind of what what works best for those? I think with canvases is again, don't be too precious over it. Because no one ultimately, they're, they're, it's an eight second vertical loop. No one's ever going to listen to a three minute, four minute song <laughs> and just watch the. So you never know. There are some super they, fans. They <laughs> no, but sometimes it's funny you say that because sometimes we'll put like a cryptic code in there and the artist might be like, go, one of my songs on my playlist has a cryptic message in there. And if you find You'll it, find it yeah. you know, so there's cool. things that you can do to use canvases that can be a bit more creative than just putting like a, a loop of your music video. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you can be as creative as that, but also just put for the first time that someone's streaming your song or they've never heard of you and they're like, I'm going to give this a second. If they just see a cool eight second loop, it might force them, not force them or guide them to go check out something mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. And that's like a cascading event. Yeah. Yeah. True. So canvases so can be fun. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and course. the thing is like what Mara says, be thoughtful. Like see, like my thing with all these platforms that people always want to like build a website to, to truly visualize what they want to be but it's like hack these things that already exist mm -hmm. you'll a save a lot of money because building a website costs a lot of money or you know and, and hack that system and because people aren't going to download a new app or it's like oh yeah i want to build an app and we always advise not to because it's quite a commitment to go to the app store download it mm -hmm. give space on your phone or whatever it is whereas actually if you spotify's installed on most people's phones anyway so if you can just hack that little vertical loop mm -hmm. and do something cool within that it will reach far more people um, and that's why, like, we do so much more on Instagram. They, you know, do so much more in these platforms. And it's like how we how, we always think, like, how, when it comes to advertising, how we can like grab people's attention and do something that that will will jar them because it's not they're not used to seeing that in the app. And it's like the, there's one that we were talking about today, which we're like sick of seeing, but like I don't think people are. It's like when it's a post that looks like something's coming out of the post. So like say that their leg is like, because they've sort of rehashed the Instagram dashboard. And so it looks like a kind of 3D post. And we're like, oh, this is so shit. But, <laughs> but actually it's really good. It, it's hacking these things and it's making feel like it's, it's being abrupt and, and people then are then seeing something that they're not used to seeing yeah. in these platforms where they're just like scrolling from, they want, to, they want a thumb stopping thing. They want to. Yeah, exactly. They want their attention to be to to be grabbed. Yeah. And where are you kind of <laughs> seeing that your roles progress? Because things are changing every day. There are new platforms constantly. Are there certain things even now that you're like, ah, oh, this is definitely going to pop. This is something that I need to start learning about. Is there anything at the moment where you think that's going to be the next thing? Yeah, I mean, there's always something happening. Mm -hmm. Always, always, always. Um, you now love TikTok. I oh, love to. I love this. So I was All I'm doing is this. I'm laughing. Huh? And I, I'm, I love it. Literally, it is amazing. Mm. But even like the filters that people are creating for these platforms mm. are absolutely phenomenal. Mm. Um, like I follow a few people that they're not professionals that work in studios. They're not in music industry type led creatives. They're just people that kind of enjoy the creative process. Um, there's a few really good. Um, Instagram filters that people are now making where they're fully 3D they track your face like anyone can download this open uh, software and you just build you just build filters um, there's a, a guy for the life of me I can't remember his name now but he made a really cool one for Travis Scott for the new album for Jack Boys um, and it was like the balaclava made in 3D um, that anyone can use mm. or he made one for Kei Tronada, um, Had he did these eyes like the pupils that were moving and then he tagged Kei Tronada, and then Kei Tronada used that as a filter of his own, okay. shared it out to people, and then thousands of people used it. Mm. So these people are finding ways to kind of hack yeah. these creative platforms and reach artists. And reach you know, artists. you know, they That's don't. You don't need a label way, yeah. to reach an artist. You do like, not. You have a message button on Instagram, you and if your message is sure, these artists receive millions. But if your message is good enough and you're persistent enough, a exactly. lot of the time it, it gets through. And I think it's creating something worth that other people want to share. Yeah. Like if I didn't make the thing for Drake, for Drake to share, mm. Mm. in a million years he was never going to see that. But a lot, a lot of people shared it, and eventually it somehow it yeah. lands on their doorstep. Mm. Instagram is a very, very, very big platform, but it's not that big because of how many people are on there. And if you make the right thing, it just cascades, mm. it just goes, and that's what makes things go viral. Mm. Quote unquote. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, there's there's definitely a lot to learn. I wanna I wanna learn badly these. 3D filter things mm. and again it's not because I want to make it for our artists which I do but I want to make some cool stuff on there mm. I want to see at home and just uh, what can I make today kind of kind of vibe um, or even on TikTok how can I make new filters I want to be part of the TikTok 
mm-hmm. error. Do you know what I mean? I don't, I don't want. I don't want to miss it. Um, but yeah, TikTok's amazing, man. Oh god, yeah. love it. So yeah, much yeah, fun. No, love it. Yeah. <laughs> but it is the key is just being flu- uh, like adaptive and fluid and constantly s- sort of aware of what's next and just like being excited by things. Mm-hmm. And it is that thing being thoughtful enough to go, how can I? be the first to do something new on this pl- on, on this platform or just with this tool like this week or, or this month the most common thing is which Disney character are you or which, you know oh, yeah. and g- give that another week or two and it'll die out mm-hmm. and it's like so if you're going to do it do it now mm-hmm. you know um, who knows and, and, and that's one thing that I want to get better at is, is sort of the research of like where these things are birthed from like sometimes it's impossible to find but there is so much information at our hands to, to be able to go why that you know, and 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 it is matter of thing of cascading. Why that trend is now becoming so common, and like people want to do it, it's good, it's a great thing. But if someone does it in six months' time, they'll be like, "Why are you doing that? That was that's yeah. six months old." <laughs> um, or it's a revival, and people are like, "Yes, you're bringing that back, like wh- whatever." Yeah, but um, so it's a thing of just like being on top of it, be it, like really being aware of like just your climate and 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 what's going on. Yeah. I think it's probably a good place to end it. Um, do you guys want to kind of explain to our audience where they can find you, where they can see your work? Is it is it Instagram that's best? I was going to give my home address, but yeah, <laughs> Instagram works. Um, Instagram is best for me. Yeah. People always ask, like, do you have a website? I'm like, Instagram is my website. <laughs> that's where they found me. That's where I'm staying. Yeah. Um, so it'll be MFB Visuals. Mm-hmm. Not on TikTok yet. No, I have it. It's the same on TikTok, <laughs> but on TikTok I'm just watching other people. Well, that's fresh enough. They're gonna follow know, you yeah, in your yeah, first yeah. one. No, by the time this goes up, I it have better to be good. Like, I don't know. You're I'll gonna be something. TikTok famous by, oh, by next week. You never know. You never know. <laughs> I'm yet to be on TikTok. I'm sure I will uh, convert soon. Um, but my Instagram's just Rory Dewar, R O R Y D E W A R. We and just say please, yeah, please well. re- reach out just in in general. Yeah, yeah. We're not always looking for massive creatives like. It can literally just be anyone that wants to be involved, that's incredibly talented. Mm-hmm. Or even if you just have a passion for it and you're curious. We get questions all the time. Yeah. And I think because we don't scream and shout that we're from industry, um, big label kind of corporate kind of type uh, vibe, that people just come to us and they ask us questions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I had the coolest one this week of like um, a guy that got in touch with me like years ago. Uh, I then wanted to interview him like when we were expanding the team and he wasn't available and he just said, oh, but I've got a friend who's like really cool. And I've followed him for ages and just nothing's come up that was right for him. Um, and then, and then yeah, this thing came up, this project came up and I was like, oh, I know the perfect guy for it. And we just got the deck through of like his creations and they were like insane and they're so good. And it's just like that came from someone messaging me on Instagram being like, hey, like I really want to work. Like, how can you help? And I was like. Not yet, but it'll it'll come. Yeah, and like yeah. two years later, it came. Like, and it wasn't that I was like I always wanted to use him, but um, it was just finding the right thing. Yeah, always reach cool. out. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks for coming on, guys. Thanks for Thank you, guys. Um, so thanks for watching, and you will be back soon with another video. And make sure to subscribe, hit that like button, turn on the bell as well, and we'll see you in the next one. <laughs>